Tonight we're doing Scottish Export BCGB BJCP style 14C. And we have a special guest. Don. Don. Yeah. Oops, Otherwise known as Kilt Brew. Kilt Brew. Normally they're not on the on the camera. So yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> we're trying something new. We are. It's okay. But, hey, you should try something new too. Why don't you go ahead and click on like on the video or subscribe or that weird bell over there that gives you an alert when we do a new video. And this way you won't miss on miss nothing. Yeah. But Scottish Export. Next on. Next on. So for this episode, we're lucky enough to get guest. Don with us. He agreed to come on to the sh to the show. Uh, I've had the joy of having several of his Scottish beers, and they're all very excellent. Thank you. Uh, he asked we describe him as a Scottish beer lover rather than expert. <laughs> so, and he brought a pile of beers with us. So, Did. so what's your home brewing experience, Don? Uh, I've been brewing for gosh, a little over ten years now. Uh huh. Um, started out like most people with the partial mash kits you get at the home brew stores and. I did three of those and found out this is a lot of fun, but the real people do all grain. Mm -hmm. So I immediately just dove head first into it and started learning. Nice. And uh, so been doing it that way ever since, and it's just fun experimenting, playing, and seeing what happens. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. I think yeah. I did one extract batch, maybe two, and then I mm -hmm. just jumped in the whole grain. It's like I'm addicted. Yes. Yeah. Th that's exactly what happens. Yeah. So, uh, for our first example, uh, we have Bellhaven Scottish Ale. So, Bellhaven is a uh, is the BJCP's suggested example for the style. Um, I never had it until we purchased these. And good beer. Oh, yeah. I was very, very happy to try it. So, let's see here. Uh, a nice pour. Thank you. You're welcome. Man, it smells good. It looks good. <laughs> can we go to the slide so I can drink this? <laughs> yeah. So uh, overall for the uh, Scottish export, we're looking at a malt-focused, generally caramelly beer with perhaps a few esters and occasionally a butterscotch aftertaste. Um, hops are only to balance and support the malt. Uh, from where hops don't grow in Scotland? Hops cannot grow in Scotland. Yeah. The growing season is too short and the temperatures are too cool. Yeah. Which is why on most Scottish ales, you have a very low hop IBU mm -hmm. on all the styles. <clears throat> Hops were looked at as an English product and were frowned upon by the Scots. So use as little as you possibly can. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, because the Scots and the Jews are pretty much as tight-fisted as they both are yeah so yeah. spend money on hops from england no we'll do other things don't give them our money and, and so actually they, they didn't English start thing, yeah. English. 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 they didn't start oh, using hops you can give us your hops <laughs> <laughs> so it anyway. was uh the 17th century before they started using much hops at all in their beer yeah uh, probably what mugwort before that or uh so they actually had several different options and i'll look those up here in a minute and we can come back to that okay okay um, see he knows a lot yeah i got the same book and if you have the book it doesn't give you the knowledge you actually gotta read it <laughs> you, you do you <laughs> know that, that's I, the when i when i first Dang get it. books i always put them underneath my pillow and sleep on them See how and much you can absorb. i have not absorbed anything <clears throat> yeah so it's worth I, a shot. I, you never I do know. have to come up and read yeah. nice so uh, the malt character on these can range from dry and grainy rich, toasty and caramelly, but never should be roasty and especially never have a peat smoke character. So do you want to go through the examples? Um, yeah, sure. So, okay. so as Mike said, uh, we're trying the Bellhaven, um, Bellhaven Scottish Ale from Dunbar East Lothian, Scotland. I think that's how you pronounce it. 5.2 ABV, 28 IBU, and then we're also going to be trying <coughs> local Laughing Lab from Bristol Brewing. Um, that's one of those things I always forget that Laughing Lab's a Scottish Ale. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, it's Laughing Lab, you know. But yeah, Laughing Lab, Scottish Ale, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 5.4% and 19 
by the U. Yeah. Now, uh, Laughing Lab actually isn't one of the BJCP recommended examples, but uh, it was the winner of the silver in the Scottish Ale category in 1996 World Beer Cup. The 2000, 2006 gold medals, the 2007, 2002, 2001, and 1996 silver medals, and the 1994, 2005, and 2010 bronze medals in the Scottish Ale category of the Great American Beer Fest. Yeah. So I all figured right, fine. It'll that's do. all you can drink up. That's fine. <laughs> If and, you're going to make me drink it, I'll be yeah, happy to. Yeah, you know, all right. So, and based on the ABV is where why we put it in Scottish export. Mm-hmm. You know, just right, right, yeah. Right. Yeah, that was something we're, yeah. Don and I were talking about beforehand. And I'll let you go into it, but I was surprised. I didn't realize that was the the deciding factor for the Scottish types of beer. So, yeah. anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah all the 14 A, B, and C categories, uh, the light, the heavy, and the export, the main differentiating factor is the beginning gravity and the ending gravity, mm-hmm. and uh, therefore the the final ABV that comes out. The light is what, 2.5 to 3.1 or 3.2, um, and then the heavy, which is kind of ironic, is, is like 3.3 to 4. So you don't think as a four percent alcohol beer is heavy? Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's an eighty shilling in in Scotland, and then the mm-hmm. the Scottish export, uh, you know, the, a sixty, seventy, uh, eighty. Yeah, sixties light, seventies heavy, eighties export, mm-hmm. and uh, that one can go from like four up to six point. Yeah, and yeah. if you get over that, you're a wee heavy. Yeah. Hmm. And you're out of the Scottish Shales. You're in the strong British beers. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, BGC, for <laughs> taking one of the best Scottish ales. Yeah. And, or actually, it's a Scotch ale. It's not a Scottish ale. That's a different. There are three Scottish ales and then Scotch ale. And the Scotch ale is the wee heavy. the wee heavy. Okay, yes. excellent. Man, he should have his own show. I know, right? He's, he's gonna... <laughs> this week on Scotch I just want to know when you're going to start drinking and commenting. Soon, soon. Actually, you can start drinking now. <laughs> I already did, thank okay. you. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, Don, did you want to take the history? Or... Right, history. The shilling designation, like I mentioned earlier, would only referred to the the cost of the barrel, and it was more of it was a taxation based on the amount of grain that went into making the beer. So, the... The lighter alcohol beer was a 60 shilling. Go up a little higher, like I mentioned, now you're at a 70, and then 80 was the highest. Mm-hmm. Now, I know there's a beer out there called 90 shilling, but there was never a category in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, I think that the was 90 a joke shilling, by them. Even though it is a great beer. Oh, yeah. and actually, I had their, I think, I can't remember the anniversary edition, but they did a 180 shilling oh my God. version <laughs> of it, a barrel now That, a that barrel would be age. like my wee heavy. Yeah, oh and, man, uh, it was good too. Yeah. So there were the, the three Scotch, Scottish ales, or light heavy export. And if you read the BJCP guidelines on the overall impression of all of them, it's almost identical throughout the entire set. All the descriptors. On, on the, all the descriptors yeah. for all three because they're all a malt forward, light on the hops, and caramel, sometimes butterscotch, you know, nice. never, never bitter, never, never peaty. Very malt yeah. focused. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, that's why like you've got down here nearly identical, but as the gravity of the beer increases, so does the character. Uh, historically, a, a party guide to different strengths. And don't get me into explaining party guide because I've tried to comprehend it and I just still don't comprehend it. So I, I, I actually <laughs> just did a party guide of yeah. an old ale and an ESB and I found a really easy way to do the calculations. So I'll talk to you after okay. the episode. And we're, we'll I'm hoping we do an episode on it when those I'll beers are ready. Sounds mm-hmm. good. Yeah. So uh, the aroma of the beer is going to be low to medium maltiness, often with flavors of toasted breadcrumbs, lady fingers, and English biscuits. Lady fingers. I definitely smell some severed woman's digits. <laughs> that, would, <laughs> that would depend on where those lady fingers have been. That's, that's really... Mm. Yeah, so uh, are... low to medium caramel and low butterscotch is allowable. Uh, a light palm fruit, fruit, ugh, fruitiness, a light palm fruitiness in best examples, and it may have a low traditional English English hop aroma, earthy, floral, orange, citrus, spicy, 
etc. Cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to stop that. And peat smoke? No. Negative, Inappropriate. Neg- yeah. Negative. And on the, the English hop aroma, most Scottish ales are made historically with an East Kent goading or a Fuggles. Yeah. Or a mixture of the both. What did you call me? <laughs> you East Kent Goldie. No, I think you meant Fuggles. Yeah, huh? yeah. Isn't that someone who doesn't have magic abilities? No, it's someone who doesn't have beer abilities. Okay, nice. okay, a Fuggle. That's a Fuggle. Oh, there we go. All right, I think we just coined a term. I'm digging nice. that. Nice. <laughs> Forget Muggles. Forget Fuggles. You're a Fuggle. You're yeah. a Fuggle. Very nice. So, yeah, the aroma on this is just delicious. Yeah. Now, yeah, the next is. beer meeting we go to and we start calling people fuggles, they're going to wonder what <laughs> exactly. we've been drinking. Exactly. Watch the video and you'll know. Yeah, what this is about. a very nice, it's drier than I expected it to be. You know? Yeah. This is, I'm really getting the, I know it says low to medium caramel, but I'm really getting the, the caramel, yeah, the butterscotch yeah. kind of aroma. I mean, it's not like sickingly sweet aroma oh, no, no. so I, I would still call it medium yeah yeah and you know that's one of the characteristics that i love about the scotty shells mm. is that malty caramel oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's you know as they go up in alcohol it, it gets a little sweeter and it's almost like drinking a, a wonderful liquid dessert i know yeah. and i found now that i'm 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 less and less about the hoppy beers. Yeah. I really like the malty beers. And yeah, the first bottle I opened up from this, I, or opened up, I was like, you know, oh my, mm-hmm. where have you been all my life? <laughs> now you know why I do this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of times where I start craving like a malty beer and I, oh, I'll try a brown and eh, not quite. And then he gave me some, some of these and yeah. I was like, yep, that's what I need to yeah. have. Now, I, I meant to make it over to Deuces Wild and pick up a knuckle dragger. But yeah. I, I just never did, and I apologize because well, that is a wonderful. It is. I agree with Scotty you. Yeah, it is. So we'll have to. Oh, it's a, I thought they classified it as a wee heavy. Is it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a wee heavy. I'll have to double it, check. Well, we'll check the, the yeah. ABV. Yeah. If, if it's over six, it technically is a wee heavy. Yeah, yeah, because I think I've got it on my list for mm-hmm. wee heavies. So we'll invite you yeah. back when we do okay. it if you want. Yeah. 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 we got a bunch I, I of these categories. I have a few more bottles yeah. of this so we can bring it back. Nice, to Oof. nice. Man, I'm going to twist my arm. <laughs> so uh, appearance is pale copper to very dark brown. And this is definitely oh, that's definitely copper. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I Beautifully clear. Copper. No. But uh, it's clear. And uh, load them moderate. See if that'll get to the camera. There you go. Well, they can read your handwriting, though. Oh, that's okay. His bank account number's on there if you have No, that's name. actually Social the stats number. for a wee heavy. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely has a, a nice white head to it. Yep. Came right back up. I mean, they're tiny cups, so we didn't have a huge pour. Yeah, power, it's, but it's hard for us to kind of do the, do the heads. That's what she said. Do you want to take flavor? Sure. Uh, flavor, it's entirely malt-focused. With flavors ranging from a, a pale, bready malt with caramel overtones to a rich, toasty malt with roasted accents, but never roasty, never like a, a, a porter or, or a stout, or, and then any combination of all of the above there. The fruity esters are not required, but they can add depth in there. Um, that one of you mentioned. A, a fruit that you were picking up earlier, I thought, and that would be your your esters. Oh, the, the no, 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 no. And the hop bitterness, just enough to balance the malt. You want a either no hop flavor or very low hop flavor, and and it should always be a, an English style. You know, the Fuggles, East Kent Golding, are traditionally correct. The earthy, floral, orange, citrus, spicy, etc. Uh, the finish ranges from rich and malty to dry and grainy. Now, this I would put in the dry and, yep, and I, almost grainy mm-hmm, agree. category. Uh, subtle butterscotch <laughs> character is acceptable. However, burnt sugars are not. And I don't get a butterscotch here at all. No, no. no. And I meant to bring <clears throat> my BJCP flaws because a butterscotch is a flaw on some beers. Yeah, yep. and for I, I wanted DM, uh, but, diacetyl. Yeah, yeah, diacetyl, yeah. Uh, the hot malt balance tilts toward malt. Malt, malt, malt. Oh, yeah. You say Scottish ales, you say malt. Yep. And as we've said many times, peat smoke is not appropriate. 
I don't know if I would know that flavor if I. I don't know either because I was gonna say I think I get a little bit of a a roastier smoky oh, no, flavor you don't. in it. But, no, okay. no, no, no. If, if on your beer that you're gonna make with the you know the peated malt, you will definitely get one. You'll definitely pick it up. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I tried making a Scotty Shale one time, and I thought, oh, that peats all over Scotland. They use, you know, peat smoke to actually malt the grains, mm-hmm. you know, fired under peat floors. Um, so let's throw a little peat in there. And I threw four ounces in, in my batch. And oh, my God. <laughs> wow. A little goes uh, a long yeah, way. Yeah, it, it was like drinking an Eiley Scotch. It was heavy, wow. heavy peat. Yeah. And so then I did another one at two ounces. And that still came out too over Really? Wow. And the third time I did it, I only put one ounce in. And then it was where I wanted it. Just that little hint. Something that makes you go, was there Pete in there? Yeah, so I had asked, and before we started recording, I asked Don, because I had been looking at a bunch of recipes after I had the Bellhaven. And uh, a lot of them used peat smoked malt. So about yeah. one ounce per five gallons, you say, is good. One to two. It one depends two. on what you're doing and what your rest of your grain bill is. Now, I've seen a lot of recipes that suggest caramelizing the first little bit of the first runnings in the kettle. Yeah, and I have done that quite often. Um, For that butterscotch I'll, flavor? Yeah, yeah, I'll actually go ahead and finish my mm-hmm. mash, get get everything in my boil kettle, and pull out uh, about a gallon, go put it on the stove and crank the thing on high and get it boiling. Mm-hmm. And um, while the rest of the, you know, the, the boil is going on, and then once I've got that boiled and reduced a little bit, I'll bring it back and dump it Open right in. There. Okay. <laughs> and it adds a lot of flavor and richness to the beer. Mm-hmm. It puts some that. depth. In yeah, the it, it does. Yeah, yeah. Because really I did that once with a ninety shilling clone, but I don't think I went far enough. Yeah. I think I was a little scared to burn it or something. But um. I, I think it's hard to burn it unless you just forget that it's on the stove. Yeah. yeah. And and you let it a gallon boil down to a cup, then mm-hmm. you then you probably burn it. <laughs> then you're in trouble. Yeah. But if you have a gallon and, and you and it's boil, time to make it and double. you boil off a pint or a, you know three cups, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're not gonna you're not gonna burn it, but you will start to caramelize, okay. caramelize some of it. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the mouthfeel of the beer is going to be uh, medium low to medium body, uh, low to moderate carbonation, and can be relatively rich and creamy to dry and grainy. And yeah, I'm with Don on this. I think it's dry and grainy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there's no, no question. And it's a, it's a medium low body and a low yeah. carbonation by now. So yeah. it all still fits into the category. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like I said, I think it's just absolutely delicious. One of the things I, I noticed when my wife and I went to Scotland and I, I made it uh, my duty to eat every example of fish and chips, every meat pie that I could possibly try for science and, for science well, yeah. yes and drink every scottish ale i could get my mm-hmm. hands on and i was amazed at the breadth of what they consider a scottish ale mm-hmm. it'll come in very light and you know like almost like a pilsner or mm-hmm. it'll come in a, a a dark but clear i mean you hold the thing up you'll see right through it but it's a dark color but it doesn't feel heavy and then you'll get other ones that are an amber color, and it will be heavy. And so they they pretty much do whatever they want to. And yeah. if you want to go over there and tell them they're wrong, go ahead. I'm well, not going to. I mean, realistically, they're Scottish. Yes. They made the they ale. Made an ale so Therefore, it's yeah. a Scotch ale. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yes. And, I ain't arguing. And Scotch whiskey, this is nothing but the first run of a Scotch whiskey. Yeah. You know, they, they make a Scotch <laughs> ale, and then they distill it. So, oh really? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Nice. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Scotch is 100% malted barley. Nice. And so basically, you're making a mash out of malted barley huh. and then distilling it. Well, I don't drink liquor, so I feel sad for all that beer that didn't go in my stomach. Did. And instead, <laughs> went the whiskey. I've newfound respect for Scotch drinkers now. Yeah. So it's like you're really drinking beer, you know? But <laughs> you are. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So we go uh, with the vital statistics? Yeah, sure. All right, original gravity, 1.040 to 1.060, and this is where you have the ability to reach the alcohol content that you mm-hmm. need to make it um, the export category. IBUs are pretty low, 15 to 30, and when you hear people making IPAs that are 80, 90, and 100, you understand why you don't pick up much hops in this beer at all. Yeah. 
Uh, the final gravity is taken down pretty low, 1.010 to 1.016. Um, this one probably came down more to the 010, yeah. and that's why it's yeah. a drop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you get to the 010 or below, you're getting a dry beer. Yeah, absolutely. If you finish it off at, at the 016, you're going to get a lot more malty sweetness in the beer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the SRM, the color is a 13 to 22, and this one's probably sitting around a 14 or maybe a 15. Uh, alcohol by volume, 3.9 to 6.0. Thanks. Um, it's pretty wide it, berth. It, it, it is yeah. a wide berth. Yeah. Um, but it's right in that range of. Let's just have a fun, good beer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not complaining. I always try to err on the on the high side if yeah. I do anything. You know, yeah. one thing I always like pointing out to the kids is uh, they have a little label on this bottle that says 300 years of beautiful beers. Yes. You know, you don't get that here in the U.S. I mean, breweries have been open for 300 years. Or what was that? We had one on one of the Belgian beers. It was forever yeah it was like open like, like seven or eight yeah, yeah, yeah it was awesome. crazy mm -hmm. thing, yeah but yeah that was nuts one day we'll get there well <laughs> well i wish i could be here to see it but yes. <laughs> i don't think modern science is going to get i'll try <laughs> i think earl's one maybe what yingling maybe isn't it america's oldest brewery i think so yeah so technically that probably is the one so and i'll put the stats for laughing lab down here um laughing lab's definitely a local favorite Yep. Um, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a go-to. Maybe not as clear right. as the Bellhaven. The Bellhaven was crystal clear. Yes. And and that's one of the things I do notice about Scottish ales is they are crystal clear. And I think that has a lot to do with the lower temperatures that they ferment and store the beer at. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse and I were talking earlier that um, in the 17 and 1800s. They fermented at fifty to sixty degrees. Yeah, whatever that and, hole in the ground. And, well, at. no, that's just what their fermentation vessels would set at. Oh, okay, okay. And then after they'd keg, they'd put them in caves or cellars, and it may be fifty to forty-five degrees there, and they'd leave it for three or four months. So, in essence, they were lagering like the Europeans did not following the British tradition of making their ales, mm -hmm. which fermented at closer to 70 degrees, and then were heavily hopped and stuck in the holds of ships and sent around the... Shipped all over the place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everywhere around the world. Everywhere, yeah. yeah. Hence the India Pale Ale. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so this one, I'm not nearly as malty. No, it's not. It, it definitely, and I think it has a lower IBU, I believe, than yeah. the Bellhaven does. But uh, one thing I noticed from it is, I, the thing I really love about the Bellhaven is the malt flavor. Right. It's so rounded. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's so uh, sophisticated. Yeah. I mean, it's there. Yeah. And it's just so nice. And with the Laughing Lab, it's just a little bit sharper, and you can combine it, it with the hops. The, you, can, the, you can pick up the hops yeah. more yeah. coming out it's here. Crisper and, meat. you know, yeah. I would, if I was judging this, you know, in a competition today, I would probably <clears throat> ding it for not having enough malt flavor. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. being too hop forward. Yeah, and of course, like we said, it's a delicious beer. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, this is, this is, we're being picky and judging it against the style. Yeah. Very, very much, but, but yeah, it's, it's sweeter, I think, than the Bellhaven. It's yeah. It's not as malty, but it's sweeter. Yeah, not so as much of a caramel flavor right. to it either. Yeah. Well, part of that could be because I probably still have some flavor in my mouth from the last beer. <laughs> mm. no. Yeah, that's good. No. Yeah, I was craving, I think we had like a whole bunch of pale ales, and I grabbed a six pack of Laughing Lab, and uh, oh, it was just like heaven, though, having a multi beer again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's oh, before I forget about it, if I can interject here. Yeah, go on, of course. While we're on the hops uh, discussion, um, I mentioned earlier that hops was a late addition into the Scottish brewery scene. And before, they used several different things. Uh, bog myrtle. Um, and that's the one that's mildly hallucinogenic. No, no, we'll, I'll get to that one. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but the bog myrtle did 
was uh, accounted on causing a rapid drunken state. Oh, nice. Oh. Anyway, if, you, know, more you play with More that, bang for your buck. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, That's why it's low ABV. Broom, also known as Gorse or Wim, it was an intensely bitter shrub that was boiled into the wort. Dandelion roots were used. Orange peel. Um, Darnell, which is a, a weed that grows among wheat, was another one. Ginger, juniper, licorice, service berries, spruce shoots, watercress, and wormwood. Okay. There's your yeah, hallucination. That's, hallucin- the hallucin- yeah. that's what's go. in absinthe. Yeah. I think I've heard yeah. of juniper. Who was now, that I about? actually... You add juniper to one I of do. Your beers, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And I don't remember if it's in this this wee heavy. Yes, it is. Yeah. So I the the wee heavy that we're going to dive into for fun later on, just to compare against the the Scottish export, does have juniper berries and star anise. Yeah, that's right. That was the other one, star anise. Yeah. yeah. Um, I put about twenty juniper berries and one whole star anise. Yeah. And that goes actually in into the boil and and then the hops that i put into it is very light Mm -hmm. yeah but we'll get into that yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. and and those additions although the bjcp doesn't include them they're they're historically they're historically accurate yeah Yeah. Yeah. i was wanting to make a more historical scottish ale and if you read descriptions about like the wee heavies um what is a wee heavy now would be a Scottish export mm-hmm. back then. Yeah. And even though they're big beers, mine, I think, comes in at 10% alcohol, that was considered a low alcohol beer. Yeah, well, yeah. World War II, they knocked all the Yeah, al- the, the 20th ABBs century down, started yeah. bringing things down. Yeah, because they, they had their form of a, a, not prohibition, but a temperance movement. And it, and it still goes on today. Um, and you look at a pint glass, and it actually has a mark on it. That you cannot feel above. Mm-hmm. Um, if you order a whiskey, um, if you've got a good waitress and she sees you're, you're American, she's going to ask you if you want a double. Yeah. And she's going to bring you that glass and you're going to go, damn, that's a single. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because they serve yeah. hard alcohol. Their measure of liquid liquor is 25 um, millim- milliliters. Mm-hmm. Which isn't a whole lot. Which yeah. is like... 0.8 ounce mm-hmm. yeah so and we you know our standard shots one and a half ounces yeah so if you want a standard whiskey you'll order a double or a triple well, no they won't Quadru- do that okay, they, okay they can't do that <laughs> yeah okay okay but yeah. huh, that's interesting yeah. so it's interesting that you'd mentioned that orange peel was one of the bitter agents yeah was, you'd think it would be harder to get orange peel than it would be to get hops exactly yeah but by the by the okay. 17th and 18th centuries they're, you know, the it's, East India Trading Company yeah. was bringing fruits that you could grow fruits in the Mediterranean that were getting brought sure. up. Um, and the Scottish had a, a huge trade network. And if you go through histories and look at a lot of the, the major explorers or leaders of military campaigns yeah. in country, they were Scots. They were Scots, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. And, yeah. and the British used them oh, excessively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The, yeah, the Highland, Highland regiments and all that. So it sounds like they're just not using hops at this point to stick a th- stick of their thumb in the eye of the Yeah, British exactly, British yeah. It, 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 was, it was an English item. Yeah. yeah. Um, they really didn't start using hops on a regular basis until the mid-1800s. Mm-hmm. Oh. And huh. then it was still a, a very light amount. Nice. They just did it enough well, to... I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was just yeah. right. It is. No, yeah. yeah, they're, they're on to something here. I think they should stick with it. That's my first <laughs> So why don't we finish these off, we'll finish these beers off, and then we'll come right back. So we're back for Don's homebrew. Yeah. So he's brought, as you can see, he's brought quite a selection of homebrew. Uh, the Scottish export, you said you just have one, uh, you have another batch that's going now, right? Uh, I'm going to do another batch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. yeah. So, yeah, I always try to keep one or two Scottish ales. It's a good policy. On, on tap at all <laughs> it's times. Good it's a good policy. And I just blew the keg doing the Scottish light. Oh, today. nice. So oh. this this is the end of the keg. Now, I'm really curious to try the Scottish light because, uh, you know, I had only a few ABV 
Um, you know, I've heard complaints of it being flavorless or very, very light, but I just don't see that. Well, you can see how dark it is. It is yeah. crazy dark. And we were dark. talking about uh, the style on how it can be almost black, but then at the same time, if we had a flashlight, you could, it is clear. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's. Yep. Oh, and you had to use the peat smoke malt with this one? No, no. No. Um, let me get the ingredients. I just want to taste peat smoke and everything, evidently. <laughs> no, you don't. So, and Don was also nice enough. He's going to share his recipes. So, we'll have links to those down in the show notes. Yeah, so this one I call my Highland Session beer. Okay. Yeah. Because it comes in at 3% alcohol. Okay. I mean, this is lower than grocery it's, store beer in Oklahoma. Say, you could sell this at a 7 Eleven. <laughs> you yeah. could, yeah. Um, it uses five and a quarter ounces of Golden Promise as the main grain. Mm -hmm. um, eight ounces of 20L Caramel Crystal, six ounces of roasted barley. Is that the roasty bar roasted yeah. barley mm -hmm. I'm getting in there? Okay. Because uh, I think after Three quarter of an ounce of Fuggles. I think that's after all you the said, hops that goes in this. Three quarters of an ounce. That's not much at all. No. Yeah. I think after you said the star anise, now I'm kind of primed to say it tastes licorice too. <laughs> well, you're I'm gonna just get, too suggestible. We're going to get to the the end of that. And the other thing I did with this is I used a Ringwood L yeast. Mm -hmm. I've used it with my Scottish L's before. It's um, it's a an off style of yeast that really doesn't fit into any beer category. Mm -hmm. I just I. Tried it one time because it can be used for Scottish ales, and mm. I liked what it did. And I liked the way it, you know, fermented everything down. Yeah, and I've heard of Ringwood before. Yeah, yeah. And I know they use it a lot in English styles. So this one started uh, original gravity of 1.032, and actually 1.033, finished at 1.010. So it's right at the bottom mm -hmm. of the category, and actually almost at the top. I think the top is 1.035 mm -hmm. for a Scottish light. Came in at 3% alcohol. And for the calorie conscience, it's only 108 calories a pint. Wow. Nice. I heard you. those calories don't count if you drink with friends, though. <clears throat> well, they don't. Plus, it's liquid bread, so it's yeah, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's delicious. I, I mean, yeah. to be such a light beer and have yeah. so much flavor. Yeah. yeah, it's it's my... Well, it was my go-to beer this summer when I was smoking... Um, on my barbecue grill mm -hmm. and because you know when I've got a brisket on I've got hours I'm going to be there and yeah I'm sorry the brisket goes on at six in the morning I'm going to start drinking <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'd like to still be cognizant by the time yeah. the guests get over it at five or six well, I mean the grill I don't think the grill cooks right if you don't have a beer on no it doesn't no. Yeah, especially it throws if, you're, it off, if you're using a, a, the old-fashioned stick burners which yeah. is what I do there, well, this would, there's no pellets there's no charcoal it's yeah you know it's oak logs oh nice go in there yeah nice this would be a good beer to like really mess with people that don't know you because they're, you know, drinking these light beers, light, light fruity beers on a hot day. You pull this thing out and, well, you monster, what are you drinking? <laughs> I do, yeah. yeah. I've done that before. You know, my wife came up to me one day and goes, you've had like seven or eight beers. And I go, they're 3% alcohol. <laughs> yeah. It's like me having two or three of my normal beers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And she goes, oh, that's why you don't act like you've not <laughs> So the other thing I'm getting from this is that you want to find an excuse to get invited to Don's. That's, well, that's, that's what I'm here, picking up. I'm so the next episode, we'll see where we film it. Good beer and smoked meat. We're always welcome. My neighbors know when they sm when when I've got the barbecue going, the smoker going. Yeah. If they can smell the smoker, they're welcome to come over. Nice. They're having to put up with the aroma. Now, it's not a lot of smoke because if you're really smoking correctly, your stack doesn't have any white smoke coming out of it at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. White smoke is dirty smoke. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so this thing burns just as clean as it can be. And uh, 
<coughs> so I, but I do fill the neighborhood up with the aroma. Oh, absolutely. The aroma is yeah. still there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then I've also got two signal flags I put up on the flagpole. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> one, one's a beer mug and the other one's a martini glass <laughs> on a white, you know, white flag. And they know when those are flying that it's open bar at the Douglas House. You, Very nice. You can just come over. You don't even have to knock. Just come on in and say hi. And nice. we're, we're there and ready to go. Man. <laughs> Start cruising his neighborhood. Just I like, know. Oh, no flags today. Dang it. I often look, put your address on Google Maps, there you go, see yeah. if I drive by it yeah, every day. Yeah, we... <laughs> nice. So the next one we're going to try here is called Archibald the Grim. Um, it started out as a Scottish light, but as I actually continued mashing and fermenting, it came out more of a Scottish heavy, just barely. Hmm. So that's what we're going to jump on on this one here so still the same overall impressions and everything Oops. just a higher alcohol <laughs> content are these ready here yep there's water in that one. Oh, oh, man. come on man a little bit lighter but not a whole lot. Like I said, it no. was. No, it I started say, that's out. very dark as well. Yeah. Well, you can kind of see through this one. You can see light through this one. I have a whole flashlight up to it. Oh, that smells good. But yeah, no, it, it's a, it actually is a lot lighter than the other one. Yeah. Nice head on it. And, yep. uh, but now this one was made with Golden Promise also. Five, five pounds, uh, eight ounces of Munich malt. Six ounces of Black Prince malt, which is a 500 SRM. That's what's giving it the dark color. Mm -hmm. And um, then four ounces of Gambrinus honey malt. That's another malt I love in my Scottish Hills. It just adds a, a sweet character that you can't get with any other malt. And three quarter ounce of East Kent Golding. And that's yeah, it. Not a lot of hops at all. Yeah. <coughs> And this one's Archibald the Grim. Right, uh, three point seven percent alcohol, little little more alcohol, but still it's still a very light beer. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, you know, I always warn people when I give them these is you're going to pick it up and think, oh, that's a dark beer. It's going to be big, heavy, big, yeah. porter oh, stout yeah. body. No, no, it's not. That's my big problem with people's impression of browns. Because mm -hmm. browns are super light. Oh, they are. Like, oh, I don't want a dark beer. Why? Dark is a color. It is. But it's another no beer. No roasted barley in this one, though, right? Hmm? No, no roasted barley? No. no. The, it's got the black Prince malt. And probably. Which is, uh, the, that's what's getting the, the roasty the, the flavor, roasty yeah. flavor, yeah. Again, light beer, okay. lots of flavor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I named this Archibald the Grim. He was the third Earl of Douglas. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I've actually been to his castle in oh, Scotland, nice. Free <clears throat> Castle. Uh, William Douglas was the first Earl. Mm -hmm. um, he died and his son became Earl at a very young age. And Archibald, his uncle, did away with him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so he could be Earl yeah. Douglas. And he had, uh, he had a five-story square castle. Um, later, it was the first castle in the British Isles to have artillery. Oh, nice. And actually designed a wall around the castle to contain that artillery. Now, what year are we looking oh, at? Oh, we're talking the late 1300s. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I mean, th he had artillery before the King of Scotland did. That's huh. awesome. Yeah. And where's that located? In, where in Scotland? Do you remember? Uh, it's in um, kind of southwestern Scotland. Okay. sets on an island in the middle of the river and when you go you have to walk about almost a mile from the parking lot through the fields or around the fields to get there and when you get up to the dock there's a bell you ring the bell and the caretaker hops in his rowboat rows across <laughs> picks you up and rows you back over 
and that's how you get to the place. Oh, wow. So it's like a tourist thing? I mean, the oh, yeah. go there all the oh, time? Yeah. So it's just this guy going back and forth all that, day? That, picking... That's his job, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got he arms was... like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't have to row very far. I yeah, mean, okay. Not even 20 yards. Oh, okay, 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 oh, okay, okay. Probably a good push from shore will get you there. Yeah. Nice. All right, we got some more clean glasses. Yep. Yep, right here. Well, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to keep this, put a stopper in it or something. Or drink it. Or, or we drink it all. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I seriously wouldn't want to see you guys do that. I mean, so this is I'm my wee, keep it. This is my wee heavy. I call it Old Scotch Ale. And like we mentioned earlier, there's Scottish Ales, the light, heavy, and export. And then there's Scotch Ale. And once you get over 6%, you're a Scotch Ale. And this is well over 6%. This is 11.1%. And it wants to be in your glass. Oh, it does. Yeah, you take that cap off, it's already re it's, ready. It's, yeah. it's like... Beautiful color on it. That is. Now, John Landeman makes a gold medal winning Wee Heavy, <laughs> and so do I. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm and, shocked that John made a gold medal winning beer. And, and we <laughs> battle back and forth every time we compete. One year, yeah. he'll, he'll win this category. The next year, I win it. The next year, he wins it. <laughs> next yeah, year, nice. I win it. <laughs> and it's like we have a monopoly on it. And Jesse's just joking. John's name comes up in a lot of it's award ceremonies. Obnoxiously <laughs> present. <laughs> you know, he's, he's an awesome brewer. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, now, I the thing that I, I always find amazing about this beer is it's very sweet. Mm -hmm. And are you picking up a lot of hot alcohol? Just only slightly. A little bit. But for an 11% beer, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. you still have that malty sweetness that this yeah. does. Yeah, it mm. is super sweet. <clears throat> and that lack of hops just makes it smooth. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this one, as far as hops, oh, I'll, I'll come back to something. Two ounces of East Kent Golding at the boil. And then at 15 minutes, I put the juniper berries, half an ounce of East Kent Golding, and the star anise in. You know, the, I, I gotta say, you weren't heavy handed with the star anise. No, no it's just one. Yeah, because I'm one star. Now, yeah, I'll be honest, star. I don't have a lot of experience with star anise. Mm -hmm. And every time I've had it, it's been yeah. just licorice. Yeah. You know, like, no. <laughs> you know. So, this one has 14 pounds of Maris Otter, four ounces of crisp pale malt, which is a 200 SRM, you know, malt. Um, Crisp pale chocolate malt, I should say. Yeah, and those are uh, yeah. British malts. Mm -hmm. Four ounces of roasted barley. That's a 300 SRM. Mm -hmm. So it's a low roasted barley. And for you, one ounce of peated malt. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> so there's, this has one ounce in it. And I dare you to find it. Yeah. Yep. Nope. I, I, I mean, you got to it, But it does add to it. I've yeah. made this without it, yeah. and it doesn't come out like this. I, I was going to say, you've got a lot of flavors in there that are mm -hmm. you know, all kind of melding in together, yep. so it's pretty complex. Well, the star anise, I could see that being... I'm either mistaking the heat for the star anise yeah, or vice yeah. versa, because it's leaving kind of like that... That uh, I don't know numbness for lack yeah, of a better yeah. phrase at the, at the finish. <laughs> I, I was thinking the you same know, thing. It's yeah. numbing my tongue. It, it, either one could be doing. Now, if that. I can ever get hold of some wormwood, yeah. I, I, I'm going to throw that in the beer. Oh okay. yeah, and I mean I, I love to make a, a Zazerac. Is wormwood legal here? Yes, no. <laughs> you can buy um, absinthe that's actually. Oh made yeah, with that's wormwood. true. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. used to not be able to, but now you can. Hmm. And. Uh, <laughs> There's nothing better than a good Zazerac with a splash of, you know, absinthe in it. Now, what's a Zazerac? It's a, um, it's a rye whiskey cocktail. Um, you take a sugar cube, two different types of bitters, um, the regular 
Angostura bitters, and then there's <clears throat> another one. I can't remember the name of it, but it took me forever to find it. Um, dash of both of those on the, the sugar cube, mm-hmm. mash up the sugar cube, put a little splash of the absinthe in, and then a, a shot, shot and a half, however big a drink you want to make, of, of rye whiskey, and put two ice cubes in, and then stir it until the ice cubes melt. Hmm. You're stirring for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then once they're melted, add some more ice and enjoy. Very nice. And it is just heaven. Huh. Thank you, people in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that explains the name. I was thinking of like a Dr. Seuss monster or something. That's right. right. I was thinking something from Douglas Adams. Oh, that's going to make yeah. a crack about the... I, I can't remember the, the galaxy president's name. Zafrock, oh. Beetlebox. Oh, yeah, Beeblebrox. Yeah. Beeblebrox, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the pan-galactic gargle blaster. <laughs> so this will all stay in the podcast, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 no, for sure. This is, man. Yeah, that's very nice. And how old is this one? Uh, 2018, so yep. two years old. Mm-hmm. I, I try to save it. But yeah, just, well, yeah. Can't. <laughs> no, I just enjoy it too much. Yeah, yeah I think that I think that's the Star and East character that I'm getting into mistaking it for heat as well. It could be, yeah. Because when I was first drinking it, I was like, oh, you know, that's the licorice. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know. yep. Man, so how does so now since I'm not familiar with the barley wine style, how does it? That reminds me of a barley wine. So what's the difference between that and a barley wine? Technically, a barley wine is even bigger in alcohol than a wee heavy. Okay, the wee heavies go from six to ten. Mm-hmm. So I'm at eleven. Technically, I'm entering barley wine okay. category. And barley wines are much heavier hop, too. That, that's they what can I was wondering. Be, yeah. Because yeah, I think the one I made had like 100 IBUs. Yeah. It. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's an IPA yeah. barley Well, and it was like a one point. I think the original gravity was like 1.11. Yeah. Well, this one started out as 1.102. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I win. I win. No. <laughs> and then finished out at 1.027. Nice. So that's Lots why we still have a lot of sugars. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. That's yeah, you don't the yeast you, said, forget it. Oh, yeah, the, the yeast had said, let me an alcohol and says, uh, you know, there, there are words that I will not use on the podcast there that the yeast is telling you about. Yeah. So, like I said, we've opened it. It must be done. I, I, I don't worry about the other stuff not getting consumed, but. Oh, yeah, this one. Is, this one needs to be yes. consumed. Well, yeah. Jesse doesn't have very far to go, so he doesn't Jesse, have to worry. Jesse, Jesse. <laughs> Here, you grab one leg. I'll grab the other. <laughs> Man, that would be an insult to this to this beer to just sit here and I chug know, it. I know. Oh, that would be terrible. You know, I we were talking about scotch earlier, and I have um, probably about 25 different scotches at my bar. Mm-hmm. And... <clears throat> I, my brother-in-law was over one day. He lives down in Houston, so him being there is kind of a, a treat for everybody. And I pour him, you know, a, a tasting glass of one of my good scotches. That's about 90 bucks a bottle. And he... <clears throat> oh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Frank, if you're going to do that to your whiskey, you know, the... Maker's Marks over there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You don't get any more of this. <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to drink this that way? No. This is sipping whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> you stick your nose in, you smell it, you let the aromas come out, put a little in your mouth, wash it around, watch it just open up, and then let it down. What I just gave you should have lasted at least a half an hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, beer's the same way, too. I mean, a lot of people drink their beer too fast. Or too cold. Yeah, or too oh, yeah. cold, absolutely, right. yeah. We are talking about, I went to um, the bowling alley at the Bass Pro Shop. I think, is it Uncle Wilmer or something? But anyway, it's in the Bass Pro Shop. And uh, 
we we ordered a picture of uh, Breckenridge's vanilla porter. Mm, yes. Oh man, it was so cold. Oh no. It was so cold, I couldn't taste anything. You can't. In it. I, I was exactly. like, can I get like a glass of water to have while I wait for this to warm up? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, and, yeah, the one story that very similar to that that I like to relate is I went to, what is that? Uh, where they have the laser tag in the bowling up there, mm-hmm. uh, the summit. And we went to eat some rest, and, you know, the restaurant. I'm like, oh, they have Bell's Too Hard to Eat. I'll have one of those. So she comes by, gives me the bottle. Bonk, there you go. Walks away. I'm like, <laughs> can I get a glass? Frosted bug, dunk, there you oh. go. It's like, oh, okay. So you go rinse the, this off for me. <laughs> <laughs> holding it in my hands and warming it up. Put it in my armpit. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's, oh, whatever. Well, I actually read somewhere that when you pour your beer into a glass, you really shouldn't tip the glass. You should just pour the beer straight down into the glass. <clears throat> Maybe not completely upside down. No, yeah, but just dump like, it all oh, in there. Okay. Let it, let it technically foam up. Yeah. Because... In reality, you want that excess carbonation well, out of the beer. Well, it brings the aromatics, aromatics yeah, out. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And if you, and the, but the guy was the, I wish I could remember who was talking about it. But they said your stomach really can't handle the carbonation. And if you drink a beer straight out of the bottle, all of that fizzing that's happening in the glass yeah. Is doing it in your stomach. In your stomach, yeah. yeah. And and you're hurting yourself. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It's like the Belgian beers are, you know, it's good for digestion, which mm-hmm. means it's highly carbonated. And uh, I think it's just the burping. They think that's good for <laughs> digestion. Which Belgian beers? They, yeah, they make they you make burp a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, I just blew my keg on my strong Belgian ale about a month ago, and I'm truly missing it. Yeah. I bet. It was one of my 9% beers. Did it have, taste like nail polish remover? No. Oh, okay. That's nothing like my this Belgian is. strong. You want to try some? I got some. Yeah, you yeah. Would you like take some home with you? <laughs> well, I, after that introduction, I may say no. I think it's flammable at this point. <laughs> it could be. Probably use I actually have on my to-do list like every six months to put one in the in the fridge and see try. if I get, yeah. Yeah, I do that too. Yeah. And it's getting worse and worse. <laughs> yeah. Which is because when we first made it, I was like, this is great. I'm going to make sure I save something. Yeah. But I learned. Uh, yeah, some beers important. do not age well. Yeah, some of this. Um, what's the brewery outside of Pagosa Springs? Um, oh, I don't know. They have an Apis Quad. Um, oh. That's a, a Belgian quad made with honey. Hmm. Mm. And oh my God, is it wonderful. And that's spelled A P I S. A P I S. Okay. Apis Quad. Yeah. And I have a bottle from I think 2012. Okay, but you don't know the brewery name. I, I forget. It'll I'll have to look it, it up and put it, it down yeah. there. Yeah. Because yeah, that sounds. And uh, but it's it's a big beer and it's a big Belgium, so I know it can age. Yeah. But I think I'm about ready to cool it down a little bit and and pop it open just to see. What's going on? So how long have you had it now? Uh, since 2012. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were... Yeah, sorry, I missed that when you said it yeah. the first time. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, Belgian quad with honey. Yeah, oh. that's, that's all I could hear. And Mike's like, there should be like a bubble right here yeah. with you. <laughs> <laughs> that's in my happy place. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. But I, I, I seen, I, I was looking at my some of my beers that I've got in my... <clears throat> garage refrigerator and i'm like oh my god i've had some of these for a while maybe i should yeah. start enjoying yeah I, I had a thought the other day that you know if i made need because so i read an article like a long time ago or it was an interview with charlie papazian and he makes a prickly pear mead every year oh really right? and uh, his wife loves mead he says you know we want enough to share we don't have to be stingy with it so he always makes a good good amount every year and whatever they don't drink, you know, when when they make it, it goes in the basement. Yeah. And uh, he he said, at this point, I have twenty five year old meads. Oh my so, lord! You know, he's got basically a, a vertical that's twenty five years long. You know, or something like that. Even more probably by now. Oh, yeah. what fun it would be to sit down and start at the youngest and work your way exactly. back. Exactly. Yeah. So and. Uh, you know, that had me thinking, you know, like, it'd be kind of neat to have a cellar full of stuff that ages really well. Mm-hmm. So when you die, you know, it's like, hey, this is the beer for the party. 
take home what you want, whatever's left over. Yeah. And this way, when you pop it open years from now, you think, yeah. hey. I remember that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, go, oh, Mike. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Mike. Still nail polish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that's the fun of home brewing. Yeah. You, you know, I've, I've had some beers that after I bottled them and let them ferment, I pop one open and it's like, it's not quite right. I can't put my thumb on it here. And I'll wait another couple of weeks and open another bottle and no, it's not getting better. <laughs> wait a couple more weeks and I think this is all going down the drain. And I, I popped open 50 bottles of beer and dumped them down the drain. You know what I like using my bad beer for is uh, liquid for the smoker. Oh, that's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, and then people are like, whoa, you use beer in your smoker? You must that's really turn idea. out a great product. <laughs> it's like, yes, that beer was at great that expense was, to was... me. <laughs> well, my, my smoker, I, I got, it's a lot more than I need. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could go commercial with this thing yeah. if I wanted to. Um, but I saw it on Facebook Marketplace. The guy up some little town south of Steamboat Springs had it for sale, and I looked at the price, and I'm like, that's less than half of what it costs me. Yeah. Way less than half. And so I drive, you know, I talked to him a couple of times, drove the four and a half hours up there and started giving it a look over, and the fire grate was pretty much burned out. The, the firebox was all rusty. There was some rust on other parts of it. Um, but these smokers are built to last decades. Mm -hmm. They're... They are solid, heavy plate steel. Uh, company is in New Hunter, Georgia. Mm -hmm. A man named Ben Lang makes them. He's been making smokers since 88. Oh, nice. And yeah. people buy them, use them for, you know, commercial, go on barbecue, competition circuits. He's had national championships off of his smokers. Hmm. And uh, so I get up there and I'm looking at the thing. And um, I'm going, well, if I, I'll offer you this much for it. And I actually knocked off, well, he was asking 28, I offered him two. Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay, just that quick. And I go, <laughs> I should have offered him 1500 he probably yeah. would have taken it. <laughs> but these things brand new are like $6,800. Oof. Yeah, yeah. And then you got to get it shipped out here. Yeah. Because he only sells at the oh, factory. Yeah. He doesn't have any distributors in the country. Is it hooked up on wheels? So yeah, it's on, okay. it's on it's on it's on you know permanently on a trailer. Yeah. Um, uh, the smoke chamber is 80 inches long, and probably 30 inches in diameter. Two wow. shelves inside there. I could probably do a 120 pound pig in there with ease. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, somebody the other day. Um, said, I actually got 500 wings in mine the other day. Wow. <laughs> okay. You can keep training them constantly. <laughs> yeah. And, your, uh, your wrist would be like, pum, 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 pum. <laughs> but, like uh, Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first time I fired it up, I, you know, you know, Mr. Lang has all these videos on how to use his smokers and stuff. So I was like, okay, I loaded the firebox up with a you know, crib of wood. <laughs> I think I had eight sticks of oak in there. Three, three, and then two. And then got my weed burner out, put it in there, and just kept blasting on it and blasting on it until the wood was all going. And did all the open this, close that, do this, all, you know, all the stuff. And then came back an hour later, and I've got like 350 degrees in my smoker. Yeah, too high. Yeah, yeah it actually yeah. was a little bit too high. So I, you know, let the fire die down a little bit. But the thing is... There's so much solid metal, mm -hmm. it takes, takes forever to, probably to, to crank back, back down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I can get it, I like to cook at about 275, actually. Okay. Um, I'm not one of these low and slow guys. Mm -hmm. I, it's, there, there's two theories, hot and fast and low and slow. And you can get too hot and too fast, and you'll burn things. Yeah, 275 but isn't that hot. Yeah. No, I mean, there's some commercial guys on the Lang website that are doing brisket at... 
275, 285. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I ben, like the ben other. Ben Franklin down in Austin does his briskets at about 285. Okay. And he cooks 110 a day. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And sells out. Yeah. $30 a pound. Oof. Yeah, I like 225, yeah. 250. It takes too long. It takes forever. It takes yeah. too long. And, and, and you can't do it. My little smoker doesn't have a lot of metal, so you can't smoke anything in the cold yeah. ones. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. this one I, I can crank out in the cold without any any problem at all. Um, it's a reverse flow, so you got your offset firebox, and then as the heat comes in, there's a solid metal plate that goes from the end of the cook chamber mm -hmm. at the firebox all the way to the other so end. So the smoke has to travel so the heat, all the way across the heat, Yeah, the heat has to go all the way underneath that plate, and it's quarter inch steel also. Yeah. And then it comes back across, and the smokestack is back on the yeah, firebox. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that plate underneath gives you this even heat. And then it's just, just amazing. Yeah. I, I was stunned. You know, I've had all these people tell me how great it was and how wonderful it is and how easy it holds temperatures and blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it does. <laughs> So when I first got it, I had to get it sand blasted. So these are pictures of it. That's just a char grill after it got sand blasted. You know you guys send me the pictures so I could show our viewers now. Oh, I do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there the it is. Oh, you're naked in that one, Don. Jeez. No, I'm just yeah. What are you doing to that thing? So this is after I just started the fire. And that's the reason there's smoke there. Uh, there's a brisket in. That's after it's going. See any smoke? Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Yes. None at all. No. There's the fire. Very nice. So that, that's what I keep going in it the whole time I'm cooking. Yeah. Nice. Well, Don, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show. I know we kind of delved in the smokers, but beer and, <laughs> we did. Beer and barbecue. Beer and barbecue. Kind of, yeah, go yeah they go yeah, together. Really so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, look for the recipes on the website. Uh, we'll have them in the show notes. And otherwise, cheers. Prost. What is the, what's your brewery name? Underkilt. Underkilt. <laughs> Got it. You know, little there was a There was a Scottish lad one day. <coughs> They've gone out partying. And he's walking back home after leaving the pub, and he's had a little too much to drink. And he's walking on the sidewalk and goes, oh, I can't go any farther. I'm going to lay sit by this tree here and take a break. Well, he falls asleep. And... A little bit later, these two ladies come walking by. They'd been at the pub also, and they see the Scotsman laying down. One girl goes, you know, I've always heard what Scots wear under their kilt. Let's find out. Well, the next day, the Scotsman wakes up, gets ready to relieve himself, lifts up his kilt, and goes, I, lad... I don't know where you've been, but I see you won the blue ribbon. <laughs> you know that's going in the outtakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there were three Scotsmen that were lifelong friends. And they'd all grown old. And one of them was laying on his deathbed. And the other two were stand, you know, standing over him, you know, just all sad that their friend's getting ready to die. And... The old dying Scott looks up, points, and says, Lads, you see that dusty bottle on top of the cupboard? That's some 60-year-old scotch. When they put me in my casket and they drop it into the grave, I want you to take that bottle and open it up and pour it over my casket. The other two looked at him looked down and said, I, we can do that, but we're going to have to run it through our kidneys first. <laughs> Thanks for watching our video. Check out our website at coloradobrewtalk.com for more great content. While you're there, be sure to leave us a comment or drop us a line with your thoughts. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at CO Brew Talk, or follow the links below. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any future content. Or episodes. As the case may be. <laughs>